So a few things for this talk. I know there are still yet more uh, subscribers to this channel. Of course, the uh, prerequisite stars are young planets and planets are older stars is in order. This is the diagram, the Walensky taylor diagram. Um, <clears throat> so I want to uh, thank Daniel Archer in particular for uh, writing two new papers. I haven't uh, given him credit for it, but um, Stellar Metamorphosis Obeys the Natural Law of Birth, Growth, Degradation, and Rebirth, or a New Law. Say Archer's Law, I'll link that to the bottom. You can read the paper for yourself. Uh, thank you, Daniel, for writing that. It's very, uh, very insightful, and it should have helped people understand that the universe as, as a whole recycles itself. Um, and his 13th paper says, Stellar Metamorphosis, red, dwarfs, or red stars evolve into brown dwarfs. And that addresses the fact that a red dwarf cools and becomes a brown dwarf. They see, look, they're right next to each other. It's, they're like an inch apart. So, of course, uh, in this theory, that's what makes sense. And in the paper, I don't want to take his, uh, take his uh, um, uh, um, steam out of that, but the, the, the difference between these two, all it really means is that they, they flare the material away. So the red dwarf, uh, when it collapses, it starts flaring a lot, losing a lot of mass, and stops shining. And strongly in the visible spectrum, it becomes a brown dwarf, which, which uh, radiates strongly in the infrared spectrum. And the astronomers are like, well, we, we, we don't have pictures of uh, red dwarfs that have evolved past that stage. Well, obviously you you wouldn't because they don't shine anymore. They they radiate strongly in the infrared spectrum. They're not bright anymore. They don't shine strongly in the visible light spectrum. So that's one hurdle that Daniel Archer addresses that, of course, we all can agree is a big hurdle. Uh, they sort of have brown dwarfs as being oddities, but they're not oddities. They're intermediate stages of stellar evolution. Um, and I also like my... Uh, the second part of this talk, I liked my uh, old World Book Encyclopedia of Science. I like to find these types of books at random book sales. This is number one. I don't know if you guys can see that. It's kind of goldish. Uh, the Heavens. The Heavens. The Celestial World. Hi, Celeste. <laughs> celestial. Um, yeah, so... The Planets, this book was written in 1984. This was the 1982 printing, so I'm holding 28 years of paper. It's, it looks in pretty good condition. There's no writing in it at all. I guess somebody had just bought it and they're just sitting on the shelf and not really looking at it all that much, but it's definitely fascinating to look at uh, these sort of what I call time capsule books. You look back in time to see what people were believing and what's changed, what hasn't changed. Of course, from my perspective, uh, and my listeners, we're basically living in the year 2060. So we look back at 2020 and we're like, you guys, come on. Um, but anyways, it's pretty fascinating how stuff like this just completely goes right over the astronomers' heads. It says here, the internal structure of Jupiter, they have liquid hydrogen, metallic hydrogen, and a silicate core. Um, check that out. See how small that silicate, co silicate core is inside of Jupiter. And if you go, that's on page 111. If you go to page 87, they have it all lined up. This is similar to what I would draw. Now a silicate core would be really small about the size of that little red, the great red spot. And then look, see when it loses hydrogen and helium, here's the old silicate cores. Here's the remains of those gas giants. Um, of course, the really small ones are a lot older. And that's what happens. And say, well, where are the stages in between the gas giants and the Earth rocky type worlds? Well, you're, you're looking at them. They, we, have, we have two of them inside our own solar system too. We have uh, Neptune and Uranus right there. So we don't have an intermediate from Neptune and Uranus to Earth, but we've been finding them through the exoplanet research. So it's all a big continuum. Uh, for you know new, new listeners here, I thought I'd just point that out. You can look for these clues inside of old books you don't necessarily need the most up-to-date internal articles or the most up-to-date, you know, flashy news articles where they, you know, try to make things sound 
um, a lot weirder or stranger than what it really is. But then again, they don't really have to do that because when you're talking something as incredible as the earth or stellar evolution, I take the approach that you can be sort of boring about it. I mean, if you don't find it interesting, just by talking normally about it, I don't see why even be involved at all because these things are absolutely incredible. They're, they're, they're absolutely massive. They're floating around in space, like, you know, and they're gonna be here long after uh, we are. So there, there they are. Um, and thirdly, for this short talk, I want to discuss a uh, new type of chronology, which is magnetochronology. Chronology meaning dating how old a star is, how old can we determine these objects are. And I, 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 seem, to, I seem to have um, hit a nail, or not hit a nail, but sort of like hit a, hit a rough patch with a lot of people online that get really angry when I mention this. But you can actually date a, the age of an object by the strength of its magnetic field. Um, it's global magnetic field per chance. Or, and um, <clears throat> so you take the global magnetic field, which in these younger, brighter, hotter objects, it's, it's absolutely massive. These things, their magnetic fields also are very turbulent. And they, as the star develops its core and it moves down here, it develops an iron core, which sort of aligns those magnetic fields. And then it becomes a much larger global um, organized magnetic field. So that happens around red dwarf stage. So red dwarf um, magnetic fields are absolutely massive. And then you have the brown dwarf magnetic fields, which are, you know, almost as massive. And then you have Jupiter. And if you've looked up a lot of stuff on Jupiter's magnetic field, it's it's just gigantic. If you look at the uh, uh, outlines of uh, Jupiter's magnetic field is just this giant thing. And that signals to me that it has an iron nickel core, which aligns the magnetic field. But basically, as the magnetic field um, diminishes, uh, it diminishes along with the age of the object. So the turbulence, the size of the magnetic, the size of the iron nickel core, how much material it has to make an internal dynamo, it all diminishes as a star cools, which means the, uh, the magnetic field shrinks as well. And when it moves down here, the magnetic field almost disappears. And for the most part, it disappears as a global magnetic field. If you look at Mars, if you look at the moon, if you look at Mercury, Venus, their magnetic fields are almost non-existent. But uh, of course, that's also ignored by the, uh, by the academics and by uh, astronomy institutions, because they don't really have an explanation for it. Why should Earth be so turbulent in, in its interior and objects just as massive as the Earth, such as Venus, I mean, Venus is as massive, but it's very close, should have basically no magnetic field at all. They just, they just sort of skim over it. They don't want to discuss that issue. But the reason why is because Venus is extremely old. The material inside is being solidified. It doesn't have that internal dynamo anymore. It doesn't have the ability to produce its own magnetic field anymore. So. There you go. It, it can't. Uh, it can't really uh, do as much as the Earth can. It can't. It, it doesn't have that type of activity anymore. It's so it's so old. And then the really old ones, like Mercury, Mercury, and the Moon, and they're just there. There's no way to produce any magnetic field at all. It's just a. It's just a rock wandering around, getting beat up by the interstellar environment, and it's eventually going to disintegrate back into the into the universe again, as Daniel Archer has outlined in his paper. But basically, um, the reason why I wanted to go with magnetochronology is the when you look when you look at objects that have extremely powerful magnetic fields and their internal cores forming and their crusts, you have alignment with that material as it's solidifying inside the interior. So you can determine how old or when that material had deposited as solid material because of the magnetic field alignments of those rocks. I don't know if, you've, if anybody's taken out the time to look at the um, magnetic field orientations of the uh, oceanic basin. Um, 
they're like layered. And that layering tells me that it layered at different times of the on the earth of the earth's history. Of course I think I think the uh the mainstream's approach is also the same. But um just just look at that. Just just look at uh if you have an extremely strong magnetic field, uh determining like how the magnetic field is oriented and how strong it is can magnetize a lot of the material as it cools and dies. And of course it starts, you know, internally and then it works its way outward. So the very top portion would be the youngest portion that's been magnetically aligned. And as you go deeper and deeper and deeper, it changes. And also, of course, it, I have this in the paper, it changes because the magnetic properties of the material also changes. When you have iron, uh, that if you heat it up, it loses magnetic field. It loses its, its, its magnetic orientation. Like if you have a magnet, just heat it up with like a blowtorch, it'll lose its magnetic uh, uh, alignment because the, the atoms then rearrange back into chaos again. But um, yeah, that's that's basically that. Um, I'll go ahead and link this uh, whole star magneto chronology paper uh, to the bottom and Daniel's two papers uh, on the bottom as well. And uh, all right, you guys, thanks for listening. Later.